Now, Christianity has its 13th apostle, a faithful witness to the love, mercy, and truth of Jesus Christ. How about you? Will you be the 13th apostle? I think this is the most extraordinary collection of talent, of human knowledge, that has ever been gathered together at the White House, with the possible exception of when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of the 13th Apostle, where we explore the good, the beautiful, and the true of the Catholic faith and the Catholic Church, and where uh, we hope to have an intellectual conversation tonight. Pray, ladies and gentlemen, pray. This is Tom Caffrey with my co-host, Dan Duddy. Hello, Tom. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm good. I don't know why you're expressing so much doubt about this episode. Yes, you do. Let's go. The audience doesn't <laughs> know the uh, the outtakes before we started recording. Those outtakes, they included a third voice. Who is that missing voice? One, Why don't you have eight, two, speak. three. I want him to speak up. <laughs> hey, Tom, how you doing? Hey, listen, how do you spell Tom? <laughs> okay, next. This is what's my line. I'm, I'm trying to make some notes here. So, uh, all right, go ahead. You, you know, you go we ahead. don't have to say your name. Well, we do, because yeah, say it. Yeah, because we don't have the same people every week listening. Again, you know, we could be someone from Nairobi, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, <laughs> Kevin Stan. Hey, everybody Stan. <laughs> Deacon. Charles, yes, Kelly with an E Y. That's right. Hey, Deacon Chuck, From Irondale, Alabama. Yeah, glad to be here. Uh, good to be joining you guys. Really, uh, mm-hmm. the pleasure as always. Great to have you. Wow. Who else? And Who else we got? My son Kevin Caffrey is uh, has swooped in, and we'll probably make a uh, oh, what's the term? Uh, well, say perhaps a brief appearance. Hello, Kevin. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Hi, Jeff. Hey, hey Kevin. I think that's a cameo. Ah, oh, thank you. I thought that was just a visual thing. See, that's why we had Deacon Chuck on for intelligence. <laughs> so we're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Our IQ, collective IQ, just became average. <laughs> Okay, well, we started this because uh, I read an article in an intellectual um, journal called The Public Discourse. <laughs> That's put out by the Witherspoon Institute on Witherspoon Street in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. And I've been getting their articles uh, for years and uh, read some of them, those that I think I can get through. Uh, and this one entitled, uh, entitled Intellectual Friendship. And uh, by Jamie Bolding. Uh, Jamie is a theologian and scientist and associate director of programs and development at the Witherspoon Institute. So I sent this article to Dan. And then I said, I'm not sure whether I said it was some trepidation, but I said, how about we invite Deacon Chuck on to add to the intellectual prowess of uh, of this conversation? And you know, with a name like Witherspoon... It has to be good. <laughs> that was a commercial break, ladies and gentlemen. Our ad man just <laughs> chimed in. <laughs> what an awesome voice he has. He does. <laughs> he has a great timber. Uh, He's falling. He has a great voice, too. Uh, <laughs> timber! <laughs> okay. That's uh, take two. All right. So, you guys, so we, re- we all read the article. Right. And... Uh, it starts out with uh, the, the presumption that the best thinking is done in solitude. Thomas Edison uh, he referred to the, his uh, thinking along those lines, that he preferred solitude. Isaac Newton, Albert Einstein, introverts, they um, uh, preferred uh, being alone to think clearly. But the gist of the article is that it's more of, and it really struck me, there's a couple of things that struck me. One related to Dan and what We've said many times in, since we started doing this, prog- this program that Dan brings 
Dan to the uh, and his thoughts and whatnot to the conversation, and Tom brings his thoughts and himself to the conversation. And we have an idea what we're going to say going into it, but we always something new happens because I don't know what Dan's going to say, and he doesn't know what I'm going to say. And then we have we just have rich conversations and discussions because of that third element that we don't know what's going to be said. And with Deacon Chuck, he and I have had some very rich conversations over the past year or so, and I've kind of likened it to arguing upward, where we're not trying to score points. Each of us is not trying to score points at the expense of the other. At least I'm not. I, I, I'm somewhat confident that Deacon Chef, but I never. Sometimes he seems like he's really eager to get that to get that point across. Oh, he's a Boston guy, Boston Red Sox. So, yeah, he's, he's probably looking for whatever, whatever he can get. Roll yeah, tide. Yeah. Uh, but I'm just gonna say, you know, the, the reason, and just quickly, the, the other, I judge uh, the intellectuality of an article by how many words I have to look up. In the dictionary, and I, you know, on a scale from one to ten, I, I got to rate this one um, a solid uh, twelve. <laughs> mm. I know those prepositions are difficult. I, I, I trip over them a lot. Um, so, do you think you're one of the inklings? Me? <laughs> now, you know, it, I think it's the. I thought of us as I when I I thought of the inklings when I when I was thinking of the three of us. So, it's more than the three, but the three big names in the inklings in Oxford, England, mm-hmm. Tolkien, author of Lord of the mm-hmm. Rings, right? uh, C.S. Lewis, um, uh, Williams was uh, uh, there's and there there were the f- there were four of them that I know were really tight and they helped to form this, but everybody knows. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, and C.S. Lewis, and the Chronicles of Narnia, and Mere Christianity, and on and on and on. And they formed a group while they were at Oxford, University of Oxford. And uh, it's amazing, because they the whole point of that, that group was to discuss the works that they were uh, engaged in, and to bounce it off the other guys. And they were the agreement was... Each of us has to take the most withering criticism, and of course, then we can enjoy uh, the encouraging, uh, uh, glowing comments in response. So we think of there, Tolkien hadn't written; he was in the process of writing *Lord of the Rings*, and he's bouncing off these guys. He's having discussions with them, and those discussions helped him, help C.S. Lewis complete their works, the ones that we've enjoyed so much. So. I, I th- not that we're in the same classes as, as those three, but we're in the spirit of that, and that's the value of, of conversation, of discussion. When you're looking for truth and to just have a better understanding of life, of reality. So anyway, I, I, you know, can I jump in? This, especially today, and like you know, where everybody, there's so many that are seem so easily bruised, right? Um, you know, and it's you and I have talked about this, Tom. You know, being able to really just um, open our minds, as you know, again, and I love that movie, uh, Man for All Seasons, where Thomas More, you know, he opens his mind selectively, you know, because he knows that to open your mind just to anyone is, it can be dangerous. Um, but to be able to do that today, it's really, to me, that's one of the reasons why I, I really treasure your friendships is because we can do that and nobody's going to run away uh, because, you know, they get their ego bruised, you know? I agree. Solitude is really, really important to me, but the exchange is where, the provocation of thoughts that I didn't really even know that I had would come forth. But I, I believe that you gain your self groundedness in a way in solitude. And I think it's imperative that you have it because you also see, you know, your own charism, a term that I really like to use and I'm using it in the classroom a lot now. And that, uh, you know, you're a creation and that you stand alone in that creation, but it's so necessary that we're, you know, that we get in communion. And, you know, Tom and I have talked about this a lot. You know, we like to joke around that we're the odd couple and, and, and things like that. But 
truly, you know, you, you can't stand alone intellectually because wh- where's it, where's it going to go? Uh, it's the friendship factor that really like stirs the pot, energizes, excites your intellectualism. And uh, it, 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 you know, Tom and I will open up a radio show with, uh, with notes and I write more notes during the show than I do before the show. And I write a lot before the show, but it's just, once again, that provocation of thoughts that make my pen move a lot during the show, you know? So it's, uh, but, to, but to have the solitude, have your feet on the ground and know who you are, back to you, Dick and Chuck, is that when you are, you know, in a group where you, you feel you're at risk if you share it, well, you got to know who you are firmly to be that guy that says, I don't think I'm in the right group to share this. Otherwise, you're, you're just like, you know, clothes hanging on a clothesline going with the wind, you know, or a cork in the ocean. Got to stand strong, too. Well, the great points uh, and great visual, you know, in terms of clothes and the clothesline and going where the wind is. Uh, I think that you know, one of the things that a good conversation is, where we're seeking, where we're seeking, like just in a way, like a marriage, uh, we're seeking the good of the other. You know, it's it's like the difference between a covenant and a contract. You know, in a contract. You look and file for yourself. What can I get out of this, that of this arrangement, and as opposed to the covenant, where what can I give to that other person or that other party? And I think I think the same way about conversation. And I, I have to be careful about that because I love the I love the spirited debate, uh, and in a debate, in a formal debate, yeah, you want to score points, you want to win. But we're not in formal debates, and we are looking for the benefit of each other. And then, you know, with the arguing upward, upward, you know, to God, it, it's you, you got to you got to know each other because then you got to develop a little trust. And that's what this Jamie Bolding writes about, where he he says, you know, it you you come to you have to understand that when you're if you're in a discussion, it's not just what you know. It's who you are. You're br- you're bringing yourself, not just your ideas. And he uses the t- the technical terms of philosophical terms, epistemology, which is the study of knowledge, the lo- uh, uh, st- uh, of just knowing objective facts and information, and ontology, which is the study of being. Who are you? What is your essence? And those are fancy terms, but they still are truthful terms. And that's so. Deacon Chuck, he brings himself in addition to his ideas and he opens himself up to me and to Dan and no doubt to others in his pastoral care in his parish and in his work and I know Dan uh, uh, does that uh, I've known Dan quite a bit longer than I've known uh, uh, Deacon Chuck but both of them they inspire me you guys inspire me to make sure that I'm giving of myself and I'm looking out for you guys Let's get to the truth as much as we can understand it. How much can we reveal of these secrets of, of life and to come closer to God in, in the process? That, that is so important. And, and, you know, the, the article states in this sense that this intellectual friendship is, he calls it deeply reciprocal, which I think is mm. great. Um, and yeah. that, and, and there's a smattering of AI that's referenced in this because I think a lot of you know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of excitement and energy about being able to go somewhere where you can get a, just a, you know, a, a bombshell of uh, of information and and data and and people seeking uh, all of that. You know, what's really true and good. But AI and it leads to this in the article is that it, it doesn't really care where the information leads you. You know, it, it will give you a lot, but it never cares and never will care where that. Uh, what it provides, where it's going to lead you, you do. <laughs> I know you do. You know, I mean, that, and that's where the dialogue, and that's the arguing up. You know, where is it going? You know, I, I think in a very real way, your your direction is is well stated. And Aquinas says, <clears throat> opening ourselves to others is a prerequisite for opening ourselves to the truth. And in order that man may do well whether in the works of the active life or in those of the contemplative life, he needs the fellowship of friends. And that's the ontological uh, necessity of uh, what we're talking about here. AI does not provide that. I'm still looking up epistemology, so 
give me a second. I looked that up at about five thirty today, so that's a theory of knowledge. But the you know when, when Paul says to the Galatians, you know, my children, he says, you know, for whom I again in labor until Christ be formed in you, that is always the goal, right? I mean, we talk about friendship. There's no greater gift than to lay down one's life for a friend, right? So. Um, if Aristotle is right, then, you know, God sees his son in us. Um, you know, we strive to make that, that match a little more clearer, uh, for one another. And, and, uh, and again, I think that's, you know, that that is always the goal. And I think that, you know, we, we always say, you know, uh, steel sharp and steel or, uh, however you used that earlier this week, but the periodic table of the of elements there, <laughs> whatever, you know, whatever we, you know, you know, trying to sharpen one another so that Christ can be formed in each other. And, and that is always the goal. And you're right. And a friend, as Aristotle said, it's like another self. Right? Mm. Amen. Yeah, another self. It's, um, it's you know, just refer to Christ's teaching about laying down one's life. And that's, you know, that's literally true, but it's also... It's true in many ways, and as Paul described Christ as emptying himself, no, I mean, total humility, uh, no ego, and so he laid down his life in many ways and models that for us, and I laid down, I should lay down my ego, empty myself of pride, so I can hear Dan, Deacon Chuck, Kevin, whomever, that that I'm not thinking. It's like I don't want to be like those um, I don't know uh, interviewers, uh, the hosts, where they're not really listening because I got to formulate the next question, and I don't I don't want to be that way, and I have to guard against uh, against that and, and and really listen. And it's really not. I so enjoy what you guys have to say that it's really most of the time it's no effort, and I'm not thinking about what I'm going to say, and I, I'm just it's kind of like yielding my mind, as well as my ego and pride, and yielding to what you guys are saying and learning, because I know I'm going to, because I trust you to. And that's one of the things that's in the article, but we know that. We don't have to read that in the article. It's trust. And if that friendship deepens enough, well, like Aristotle and Jesus and many people have written, it's love. And because I, you know, we, the one values the other so much that you you're looking at the, what is that what is our divine love our agape love is you know willing the good of the other and that's that that's it makes it it makes the conversation and the discussion uh, easy yeah there's there's a confidence there's a confidence there um in the in the friendship that that it's not going to dissolve very easily <laughs> you know um right. and you know we had talked a while ago and that's really the call of our faith right is that i you know, I think we were saying how, you know, I love the fact that my my faith is difficult, that, you know, that I have to work for it. That, um, but it's there's a sturdiness to it, like there is to the friendship that, um, you know, it's, it's not going to dissolve uh, just because of any particular set of words that are shared. Or um, So being able to have that, we can, you know, uh, push our boots into the into the stirrups a little bit and, you know, keep, you know, keep going forward you know yeah and when you say when you say boots as you were speaking there i'm thinking about groundedness and and dirt you know friendship puts us a deep you know human friendship puts us down there into the truth that, that we like to say the dirt and it inspires like it, it enriches uh like even the greatest of all knowledge i think and in intellect and, and that's wisdom where where the truth lies you know so to, to find the greatest of all knowledge is wisdom and, it, and it's in the dirt it's in our humanity it's in the, the truth of who we are yeah, is Kevin still there, Tom? In, he is indeed. Sure. Actually, one of the things this conversation is making me think of is not only the the conversations that we have with our friends, and that embodying the idea of laying your life down for your friend, uh, but also the conversations we have with people we don't know. Because one of the things that's more uh, risky or dangerous about having deep conversations with people that we don't know is that we're exposing more of ourselves to them in a certain way. Um, in some ways, we are what we think. And so by showing people what we think, we expose who we really are. That can be a dangerous thing, but it's also more adventurous. And I think it speaks a bit to 
the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan, where Christ calls us to help the people that are not from within our group, who are not our closest friends. That's awesome, and we are what we do, too. And a lot of friends will call you out to that, too, I think, Kevin, right? Where we, we speak like we think, you know, think this is who we are, and they'll say, well, that's not, doesn't follow your actions, don't follow that, or you're right. That is who you are because that's what you do. It's important because the true friends will will uh, either affirm that or call you out on that. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. this uh, it, when you know, like uh, the article speaks of, like like any other healthy relationship, it requires humility, openness, and then there's a sense of limit, which I it's mentioned a couple of times. And it is. I, I think yeah. friends like you know friends like feelings are not infallible, <laughs> right? And uh, a real friend knows this and remains coachable. You know, Dan, nobody probably knows this better than you. Being coachable, you know, means, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I know there's a gap in my knowing. I, I, I you know, I'm not infallible. And uh, I, I always have this element of uh, my limits. Um, mm. that there, there are going to be limits to my whatever dialogue we enter into. I think when we, you know, conversations get into trouble uh, when persons think that they they are the end of it, you know, that. And I, you know, I've already done the, you know, my I've had my thought construct and I've already gone to the far reaches of the dialogue and there's really nothing else to know. You know, that's when things get really sticky, I think. That's a huge point. That's when the relationship actually stops at that point. And then, exactly. then, you're, then you're stonewalled and then you're, you're just wherever you are at that moment, that's your plateau and there's no more going up. Great point. Well, I was talking with Kevin a little bit uh, a little while ago uh, knowing that we were going to have this conversation and uh, partly about friends and friendships and I said if you're willing to open yourself up you, you know the old saying if you want a friend be a friend and here it is I mean I'm, I became friends with Dan in my late 50s I became friends with Deacon Chuck in my mid 60s. So, you know, there's no, it's not like we have this idea we have to form our friendships in our, in our youth or our schools or whatnot. I mean, that certainly happens, but uh, it's just, it just keeps going. It can go on and on if you're willing to, if you're willing to be that person to somebody else and show those other people that, that, that they're important to you. But that those relationships probably wouldn't have happened if even at the point where you didn't know each other very well, you weren't willing to take the risk of exposing what your true thoughts are and what you believe to be the truth. And I think with that comes a level of respect on both ends. Mm-hmm. But you get you get the strength to do so in your solitude. You have the spine to do so when you know you can pull back and still be strong. Taking that risk. Well, I can think of, uh, you know, when... Dan brings Dan, you know, he, I, I have so many, I can think of so many examples. In fact, I just wrote one down, something you said tonight, and I I catch you many times uh, where you say something, you don't realize the significance of it, and I always like to stop and, and repeat that. You know, so you, you, you've given yourself, and then this is not a, this is not a, this is your life, or and Duddy, but it is acknowledgement that this is the example. We want to be witnesses to this. And so when you give yourself, when I can think of, you know, when we went, did the retreat up in uh, St. Benedict Abbey, up in Stillwater, Massachusetts, uh, with Deacon Chuck uh, as our guide, so yeah. to speak. You know, well, after I, I know that after I uh, finished my one talk, it was kind of emotional, and uh, headed out back to my seat, and he got in my way and gave me a big bear hug. And, uh, you know, the rest is history. You know, something like that. It's, uh, these are big deals, and uh, he was willing to do that. That's true. I still have your wallet, by the way. I, that was that just... <laughs> I got your watch. Yeah, I See, still have that watch. That's you crazy. can't help yourself, can you? It's not your fault. No, I... <laughs> no God made no. you this way. <laughs> Oh, I tell you, one day I want to—I want to be where Deacon Chuck is given is uh, given the homily, and you know maybe I could just be after I give the raise my hand, stand up, and give a hallelujah. I might give a footnote to his homily so they know the other side of Deacon Chuck. But there's only good oh, that's side. Right. There's only good side. Speaking, speaking of critical thinking, <laughs> you know, the, in the 
in the article, it's that's mentioned a couple of times, and I wanted to get, I wanted to ask you about that. That I, I assume that you had some thoughts on that as well. I've always had a problem with the term. Uh, it seems to be overused and kind of it's one of those elastic words that you know or phrases, and it seems to be in some some ways the enemy of the dogmatic. You know that, that thinking critically is, you know, seems to promote this self-initiated truth based on my own cognition, you know, that I've done this and I've developed this and, and that it's often used, I think, as kind of a veto button for any facts or things that, you know, there are unchallengeable truths. There are things that you're going to bump up against that are uh, non-negotiables, right? You know, so I wanted to ask you, Tom, in particular, that when you read that part about critical thinking, how did that sit with you? All right. Well, first of all, we have about 30 seconds. Uh, that, and what you just said is probably the most intelligent thing that was said in this conversation. Uh, hey, it's the, I'm still looking that up. Hold on. No, <laughs> that when I saw, on, Chris, it's amazing. It's amazing, Deacon Chuck, because I thought essentially the same thing when I saw the critical thinking. I was actually surprised that a guy uh, at his mm. level would put that in right. because you are right. It's so overused. It's been, they've been using it in school in the public school system for probably two decades at least, critical thinking. And we seem to have a lot of critics, but very little thinking. Uh, as, it's become a uh, platitude, really. <clears throat> I mean, I, you know, I don't, I'm not quite sure what he was trying to try about there. Well, Deacon Chuck, but, we, we know that the dogma lives loudly within you. Oh, oh my oh, gosh! That's uh, 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 Senator <laughs> Feinstein is uh, is celebrating in her grave. <laughs> uh, okay, I can't handle two Capris. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Deacon Chuck was wonderful. Thanks for agreeing to this, and uh, Danny, you got to tell us what's There's coming awesome up. Guest. Yeah, what's coming yeah. up next? Hey, thanks, guys. Really, really enjoyed this. Stay God bless you. Folks. My pleasure. Yep. Uh, thank you. You too. Stay tuned, folks, for the Angelus and your prayer intentions with, say, Deacon Chuck, Peter, and Jimmy. Oh, listen to that voice in the Ed Man speakers. Yeah, man. <laughs> uh, God bless. Dan Daddy, Deacon Chuck, Kevin Caffrey, Thomas Caffrey. God bless all. God bless you, Mary Ann, Jean, James, Tom, and the rest of the crew. Thank you for listening to the 13th Apostle with Dan Duddy and Tom Caffrey. For more information on Dan, visit his website at www.danduddy.com or email dcduddy at gmail.com. Tom's website is faithpilgrims.com or email trcaffrey at faithpilgrims.com. How about you? Will you be the 13th Apostle?